Happy to connect you all with Darko Rayakovic, who is currently an assistant coach with the Phoenix Suns. He has also been an assistant coach with Oklahoma City Thunder, a head coach in the G League, and also is very involved with the Serbian national program where he's an assistant coach. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's my big honor to be part of the podcast. Uh, I've been following your work and uh, for a long time. We know each other personally for a long time. And uh, I got to give you credit for doing an amazing job and uh, for our coaches community, this podcast and, uh, and uh, the whole platform of Basketball Immersion that means so much for us. Thank you for, for sharing basketball with us. Well, thanks for saying that. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited because I've got to know you. Uh, I'm very excited that we can share more of you with the world as well. And sometimes it's hard to get access with some NBA coaches, but you've always been very willing to talk, discuss, and share, and I'm grateful for that. And today we're going to talk about offensive identity. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you? Absolutely. So uh, this year when we established our coaching staff with uh, Coach Monty Williams in Phoenix Suns, we had long discussions over the summer. Uh, what do we want our team to look like? And uh, for in order for that, we had to describe our identity, what kind of identity we wanted to uh, create. And uh, after doing our homework, scouting our players, um, you know, establishing roster, getting to know guys, talking to players, and just knowing the current state of the team and what we needed to do to uh, move the team into the right direction, um, we came up with uh, with five things that we really believe that's going to help us uh, to move the needle with our team. And uh, we described our offensive identity uh, as uh, playing basketball with 0.5, uh, which means making quick decisions uh, in 0.5 seconds make a shot, put a ball on the floor, drive it, make a pass. You got to make quick decisions. There is no holding on the ball. There is no playing a lot of ISO ball. And we just wanted to play fast. Second thing was paint to great. Uh, we all know the importance of uh, getting to the paint and uh, having great shots. And uh, uh, when we create advantage, we wanted to finish at the rim, but when defense would go into rot rotations or commit to a not ball, we wanted to have paint to great, to, to create better shot. Next layer to our uh, offensive identity was good to great. We did not want to just to get good shots. We wanted to get great shots. And we really believe into... Um, equal opportunities on our team. And uh, we wanted to put our guys in a situation they, they're gonna have freedom and to make quick decisions and to play for each other and to create best shots available. Uh, fourth layer was execution. We wanted our guys to play together, but to play inside of certain principles, rules. Not sets, but rules. And then one thing that we really believe is going to move the needle for our team was limiting turnovers. And we all know that turnovers lead to easy points uh, on the other side. It's really hard to control your transition defense. And we just wanted to have the best available shot every time down the floor. Tremendous stuff. Great way to be able to dive deeper into some of these topics. And, and we're going to, but I want to circle back with the 0.5 concept. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, as you know, in my phrasing, it's called zero seconds on the website, same concept. But what I'm wondering, is there a time for the game to slow down and for players to slow down? And if so, what are some of those situations? Oh, absolutely. Um, we put our offensive identity there so we can always go back in the critical times of the game like when things are not going the way we want. Like we, we wanted our identity to be there so we can remind our guys and get them back to that style of play. Of course, there are times um, it's not the same thing if you're running your offense after made basket, if you're running your offense after missed shot and getting rebound on the live ball turnovers, after free throws. All of those situations, situations demand different way of executing your offense and putting your offense in the best best situation to to be uh, effective and um, for us point five was the way of uh, to make guys to play together to depend on each other to to uh, uh, play we call it beautiful basketball you know all of us uh, on, on our coaching staff uh, uh, led by coach Monty 
we loved San Antonio way of playing basketball uh, when they were the peak of, of their game. And we believe that for our team and the talent level of, of our guys, that was the right way to go about it and uh, that we had to play all together. Of course, there are parts of the game that you need to slow down, that you need maybe to run some set, maybe to put uh, the ball in the hands of your best player or Devin Booker or uh, Ricky Rubio or uh, Aiton to post up and to create advantages there. But also we wanted to, to, to our uh, base, baseline style of play always be playing inside 0.5 rules. Love it. And, uh, you know, the other thing is the good, great concept, which is great phrasing. And I love that. And I love teaching it. But so there's sometimes a danger in teaching this good to great concept because you ultimately want your players to be confident in shooting their shot in their spot. So I'm wondering, how do you educate and develop this concept of good to great for your players? For us, it was a big part, like Coach Monty uh, and, and we as a staff, we wanted our guys really to be confident and uh, to, to, to play together and uh, to put guys in situations where they're really successful. Now, uh, concept good to great also means that we wanted uh, players to understand that if they, they have a better option than, than the first one, they got to see those situations. And we would never be like uh, too... Um, too strict with guys. Nobody would go on the bench for, for taking a shot like that. But over the course of the whole year, we kept educating guys of the importance of playing it the right way. We kept showing the film of uh, moving the ball, find, finding extra passes, finding open shots. And uh, of course, all of that is backed up with analytics. Uh, if uh, we have wide open shot in a corner, uh, that, that that's going to be a high quality shot comparing even Devin Booker taking contested shot that's, that might be from the elbow area. So we also educated guys of um, importance where the shots are coming from, shot distribution, the value of those shots. And also, uh, also uh, we wanted guys to have a feeling of playing together. And we identified that was, that was a problem kind of in the past for the team and uh, some of the guys on the team, they, they played too much ISO ball. And this was our way to establish culture and to establish new things for, for our team that we, we believe are going to move our team in the right direction. Well, and that was reflected in the league, the league and assists game goal. Exactly. So uh, <clears throat> for the big part of the year, uh, we were averaging uh, 30, about 30 assists per game. And big part of that, of course, is uh, having Ricky Ruby on the team, who is a great point guard and a pass-first point guard. But all the guys uh, from our experience is players want to play inside of system where they're touching the ball. Not necessarily getting shots, but they want to touch the ball. They want to feel that they are part of the offense. They, they want to, to get a, a good rhythm for the game. And all the players, they, they feel much more confident, like if they're constantly touching the ball, when the shot actually comes to them, they're going to feel much confident shooting the ball. And we always encourage guys to, to be ready to shoot the ball and shoot first mentality. And uh, we, had, we had really good and humble guys that accepted that concept. And, uh, and actually, we, we made some, some really good strides with our team. Well, you absolutely did. And you guys were fun to watch. And uh, it was great to see that change uh, on the floor. Uh, speaking to high school coaches who maybe can't change their roster and uh, influence things as much uh, in that way, what are some ways to be able to develop that mindset? So uh, limiting turnovers uh, uh, it was a part of the execution. And uh, when guys have good spacing, when guys get in the right spots, when guys are playing off of each other, uh, that, that, that's going to kind of like take care of itself. Again, if you want to be a team that moves the ball a lot, that passes the ball a lot, uh, of course, you're going to have turnovers. You're going to commit some turnovers and you're going to be you got to be able to live with some of those turnovers. We just that didn't want to have any uh, unforced turnovers. They, they, they're going to lead to, to uh, easy baskets in transition for the opposing team. 
and uh, we we had pretty good response from our team. We did a bunch of drills in uh, during the course of the season. They was going to put us in position to be successful with it. Uh, we had uh, games inside the practice where we would take away point uh, from a team if they have a, uh, if they commit a turnover. But at the same time. Uh, we just wanted guys to play freely, to play with a lot of confidence, and to play off of each other. So I love that you said it that way, and I love that the turnover part of it, and and the permission to make turnovers within the framework that you define, helps players be more comfortable. And you brought up Rubio already, and, and to me, what when you think of a player like that, it's a great model for a turnover, right? Because his turnovers are the ones that are seeking solutions and possibilities out of creativity. And maybe that the other players don't see. So actually learning from his turnovers probably helps players see other possibilities. Yeah, Chris, you're absolutely right. Um, Ricky was, uh, Ricky is uh, such a huge part in our rebuild and uh, establishing our culture. And uh, when he plays that way, when he plays, uh, to find other guys, to improve other guys. Uh, that brings a lot of confidence into his play. And other guys are also allowing themselves to, to play that way. What I mean by that is uh, I think that one very important concept is player needs to be confident to make mistake. He needs to be, as, as you said, in, inside of the framework of what you're doing. But they got to be willing and vulnerable enough to try to do new things, to try to, to improve. That's the only way you can improve as a player, improve as a coach, improve as, as a human being. You got to try to do it. You, you got to have, but you got to have good intentions behind it. And um, that's why example of, of our leader of uh, Ricky Rubio was so huge and uh, empowered some other guys to go that direction. And uh, that helped us to be the best team in NBA in moving the ball and, and, and number of assists per game. Let's get back to this whole broad picture of identity. The identity never changes, but the identity gives you a framework to be able to add or subtract different things. Can you talk about that? Um, identity, identity is something that, that you always go back to it. That's your baseline and that's your finish line. Uh, we had, uh, this year, we had a bunch of games that, you know, under the pressure of the score, under the pressure of, you know, uh, trying to win games, like guys would try to be a little bit heroes and take it on, on themselves and try to win the game and try to do things that, that's going to help the team. But that's a huge point at that point of time to, to, to get back to your baseline and to remind guys, okay. Slow down, breathe. <laughs> you know, we gotta go back to our, the, to to the way we play. We, you gotta trust each other. You gotta move the ball. And a lot of times under the pressure, players have tendency. Like we are talking about NBA guys and top players in the world. Uh, it's it's normal thing for those guys. They have confidence. They, they, they and and they know they are capable of doing things. So to to at the same time for those guys not to have a tunnel vision. And to be able to share the ball and play inside the rules and play inside the team, you constantly got to go back and remind guys about that offensive identity and the way we want to play, what's going to give us the best chance in the game. And that approach uh, really helped us in a bunch of games to, to uh, win games. And you could really see that after timeout, guys going back on the floor like, okay, we know what we need to do right now. Like, I, I don't need to do it everything by myself like if you play 0.5 if i move the ball if i find my my open teammate things will take care of itself and uh you know talk talk a little bit about uh offensive buckets because i know this is the second part of this whole if we're talking about installing an offense we're talking about building an offense we're talking about offensive philosophy for you or the sons we're talking about establishing an offensive identity and then figuring out how you're going to get offensive can you talk about that? Absolutely. So uh, one big thing for us is uh, allowing guys to play inside those rules, but also to play with, uh, without thinking too much. We wanted players to, to get comfortable with, with the offense, to play 
inside their uh, strengths. And that's why we divided our playbook in those offensive buckets. So first, first thing on off offensive buckets is like, there was a way we wanted to play after missed offense. Like if uh, offense would miss the shot, we get a defensive rebound and we're running in open court. And what we really wanted to, to achieve there in this offense is to spread the floor, to get our wings wide and open in, in an extreme corner, in a deep corner. We wanted our five men to rim run if he had a chance. And if he, and he was uh, in the same level with the ball, with a point guard, then they could go into early pick and rolls or wide pin down. We, we had certain rules for our miss offense and what we wanted to achieve. And second part of it was like, uh, after make offense, when opposing team makes a shot, what are, what are we in? And we had this offense that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in later, like much, much more in depth is uh, we called it auto and it was creating equal opportunity, opportunities. It was reflection of our 0.5 mentality. Uh, so third bucket was plays and rules after free throws, what we wanted to run. Then uh, we had SOBs, uh, sideline out of bounds, baseline out of bounds. Um, after timeout plays, uh, we had uh, plays that we're running in deep corner, what we wanted to run, full court if team was uh, pressuring us, uh, three quarters of the court if you were inbounding the ball on side. Then we had two for one rules, we had slow two for one. We had get in ball and then special situations, end of the game situations. So inside, I, inside each of these, these groups, so we had certain rules and certain plays and it was a small bucket. So guys would much quicker recognize what they're winning and, and they will be able to execute it. So each of those became a defining part in terms of your philosophy and what you guys were trying to do. But talk about install. Let's go all the way back to training camp in terms of install. Where did you start in terms of what we've already established, offensive identity? Where do we now start? That's, that's really good question. And uh, I'm, I'm going to tell one short story that's going to help describe like uh, mentality that we had this year. So uh, our preseason, we didn't have it here in, in Phoenix. We had it in Flagstaff, which is like two hours drive from Phoenix uh, in, in the mountains. And our first five days of uh, training camp uh, were supposed to, to be there. So once we came to the bus, whole, you know, coaching staff, players, support staff, um, Coach Monty told everybody that the first thing that they're going to do when we, uh, we come to Flagstaff is we're going to have a conditioning test. And he did not talk about that to us, players or anybody. Nobody know, knew about what, what, what he, he's going to do. And he just said, like, just trust me. When we get there, you'll see. So it was funny, right? So for two hours on the bus, nobody said a word. We came to Flagstaff and you could see that players, they were confused, they were afraid, like, you know, everybody imagining that they'll be doing some suicides and running and guys questioning, am I in good shape or whatever it might be. So instead of going to the gym or working out, we came to the video room and uh, there was only one slide that coach showed on TV and it was conditioning test. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 he made a story about it. Like you guys, you were so quiet on the bus. Like you were thinking about this, but actually conditioning test is, is gonna be something that you're gonna be facing all year long. NBA season brings a lot of challenges. For somebody, it's a contract year. For somebody, it's playing time. You're going to have a self-doubt. You're going to have a stress. You're going to have confidence. You, at some point, you're going to experience arrogance. You're going to have fatigue, media, social media, all of that stuff. So big part of that was trying to prepare players for the challenges that are coming. And we got to stay true to who we want to be and to have our identity, offensive and defensive identity. And all of that led us into preparation for the first day of a training camp and to bring our mental stamina that is going to follow us all, all year. 
So a lot of times later in the year, we use that story and mentioning it to, to players to remind guys about this is actually the moment we talked about. Those are, are the obstacles we're going to be facing and we got to go back to conditioning test. We got to condition ourselves to be ready for those challenges. So after that, it was much easier to install our offense like uh no doubt is is that unique like you've never experienced that type of thing before at the nba level uh, i never i never experienced that before and uh, i talked to all, uh, other assistant coaches everybody were surprised and uh, just having coach monty keep that in his back pocket and not even sharing with us like even us as coaches like we were thinking what's going on like what's gonna be when we get there and that was his way of getting guys attention on the big picture and what the most important thing is, you know. Well, it speaks to one of the most important parts of coaching, which is to make the comfortable uncomfortable and then make them comfortable again. And that's the part of this the process of developing a team in this example, taking it over in a whole new organization as well. That's right. That's right, Chris. You're absolutely right. So, um, our training camp, uh, uh, we dedicated a lot of times to put our offensive system in. And uh, uh, we knew that we have completely new team, completely new coaching staff, and that we could not skip steps, but we wanted to be able to play five of five as soon as possible and to allow guys to show their talents inside the offense as soon as possible. So... Uh, First day uh, in the practice uh, on, on offensive end, we put uh, just one play in, just basic zipper into the rub. And we put basic rules in our make offense, in our offense, that we explained spacing, which is uh, wings. They got to come not to the extreme corner, but to the break. Trailer is going to be at top of the key. Uh, four men or five men because those two positions are interchangeable. He's going to be on the elbow on the opposite side from the ball and point guard bringing the ball on the side. And uh, we just showed our guys like one or two options of that, uh, that, that offense. And we told guys that inside the offense is going to be our, is going to be a description of our whole offensive identity. And we wanted players to come up with their own solutions, with their own ideas, with their own set of rules. And we wanted to start playing as soon as possible. So when we were developing that offense and preparing for the season, you know, we had, uh, we had seven, eight options on one side of the floor, as many on the other side. If the ball catches the, is at the elbow, we had five or six options. So as you can see, like if we would try to install all of those options and teach players, it would just take so much time and it would be hard for guys to, to, uh, to uh, uh, absorb all of that. And it's gonna, it, it, would be, uh, it would slow players down. It would slow their thinking down. And instead of doing that, we show them option one and two. And naturally, they came up to the option three, four, and five. And actually, what was the best part about it? They showed us some options that we, we did not have in our mind, we did not have on a paper, and they come up with solutions, you know. And I think the, that, that offense that we were able to implement was, uh, was great, great re reflection of our identity the way we wanted to play, but also installing confidence in our players, allowing them to play their instincts and to play uh, free basketball and to play off of each other. Of course, there were certain rules. You know, if defense is going to overplay and deny the pass, we have a counter. We knew we, knew we wanted to go uh, to backdoor cut. And just to go back to the positioning of the players, that's one of the main reasons why in our make offense, in our offense, we did not want wings to go all the way to extreme corner, but we wanted those guys to be at the break because at the break, a lot of times defense would overplay and try to break the play down, and that would allow much more room for some uh, backdoor cuts. If defense is trying to play behind the player and chase the action, then it would allow us to have some face cuts. 
and uh, cutting was a huge part of what we wanted to do this year. Cutting. Coach, just let me stop you there. Just before we, we go on, I've got to stop. I get asked all the time about a game's approach and some of the strengths of the game's approach to coaching. And you just described it perfectly. Uh, n without the scientific words or anything like that, you just described it to a T. And I get asked a lot by coaches, what does this all mean? What are you talking about? And you just nailed it. And uh, I just want to go back and remind coaches what you started all this with. Install one play and let them play. From there, you can add constraints, which are things that shape learning. And is in your example, you know, rules, restrictions, different things like that that shape learning. We don't have to install everything all at once. We can mix in letting them play with installation. And to me, this is this is brilliant. I'm so happy you shared this. Chris, uh, um, I wish that I'm smarter that I could use more of a scientific words, but I'm just using common, <laughs> common well, that's basketball. Why you, that's why you joined <laughs> Basketball Immersion to learn those words. But no, you don't have to use the words. The words aren't that important. But the point is, is that really smart coaches get this already. And a lot of them are doing this already. This isn't like a new thing. Sometimes I just add vocabulary. So, uh, uh, Chris, just to piggyback on what you said there, and uh, it, it is very important that way, the way we installed the, the offense. The second part of that is we had our combo work, which was uh, three on zero, very, very few times three on zero. Usually it was three against coaches or three on three. So we had approach whole, part, whole. And when we were in the hole, when we were introduced the whole whole concept, uh, it was just teaching one or two options. Then when we go, we would go to to combo work, it was the same approach. Sometimes we used our coaches, and coaches uh, they would mix up different coverages. So players they had to recognize, they had to play against. For example, if it would be pick and roll, and defense is is a blitz. We knew we had set the rules how big man needs to open, that he needs to go in a short roll, that we had to have certain spacing on the floor. And that, that, that part of teaching really helped us to have really quick transition into, uh, into playing five on five and uh, for players to understand that concept and to, to, to have recognition of all, all of those situations. So the having approach whole parts whole is something that really, really helped us this year to install offense quickly and uh, to allow offense to breathe, to allow, to allow offense and allow players to bring their own creation to it and their own stamp to it. Brilliant, brilliant, great stuff. And we're going to go a lot of places still, but I know one of the areas that we wanted to focus on is uh, offense after makes and this concept of what you call auto. And just so you know, coaches, I'm going to put a full edit of auto on uh, – basketball immersions youtube channel so be sure to subscribe if you're not uh put that up next tuesday so you can put some uh words and visuals together to the auto offense that we're talking about now can you give us some of the talking points about auto a couple of things there so we wanted our four men or five men who whoever was closer to inbound ball and four and five men they were interchangeable so uh we wanted to have quick inbound to get a ball to the point guard into his hands and for point guard, if he had a hit ahead and uh, opportunities to run and score right away, we would do it. But if point guard would bring the ball down the floor, we wanted players to get to certain points uh, on the floor. And four and five, they were interchangeable, as I said, and they would occupy a trailer spot and opposite elbow spot. Wings would be at the, at the break and point guard would bring the ball down the floor. So from that point of view, we wanted to be in those spots with 20 seconds in the clock. So we wanted really to push the ball, to give ourselves a chance to attack early in the clock. But if we did not have that opportunity and defense is already set, then we would go to, to auto and to different options out of it. So uh, I always like to say you have to name it in order to teach it. So we did not show all the options to the players uh, right away. But once they got that option, we tried to give it a name, you know. 
So uh, if we would bring the ball down, we had pass the ball to the trailer up top, and the, we, we would uh, uh, try to pass the ball to the elbow to our four men or five, four, four or five men, whoever was at the elbow. And that option was, we called it hit elbow. We did not have to call it every single time, but if we saw the advantage with our four or five men at the elbow, you know, coach had always that freedom on the side to, 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 to tell a point guard, to tell Ricky, hit elbow. And we would know exactly know what we're going into. Uh, so uh, that part of offense, so we could just call out and play completely freely, or we could call, call certain options of that offense where we saw advantage of, uh, in certain positions, and we could go st straight to that. So uh, what it opened up for us is uh, great uh, uh, body movement, great ball movement, uh, great spacing. And uh, this year we were the fourth best team in NBA in scoring of, of the cuts. And uh, when you play that way, when you have a lot of cuts, when you have ball movement, when players always feel they're part of the offense, that really helped uh, our morale and confidence and the, uh, allowed our offense to grow uh, as the year was pro progressing. Good stuff, good stuff. And under, helps us understand that kind of process of not just installation, but implementation as well. Uh, auto in the basic terms is a template, right? There's automatics, are there rules? I know there's possibilities. You spoke to that a little bit, but can you also call plays out of it? Yes, uh, so for example, we could call a play that's gonna get us in one five pick at all on the side with uh, spacing on the other side to open the floor. We could get into uh, pistol action uh, that would be a step up from a guard coming from a break. And uh, we would allow that player again to read if he can roll to the rim or he, he could come off the flare from the top. Uh, we had options if the ball would come on the same side of the floor. Uh, we had a play call to go it on the back side. On, on the opposite side of the floor. And inside of all of those, there were certain rules. If ball goes one way, like, first of all, we wanted spacing, we wanted body movement, and we wanted freedom. We wanted players to make decisions on their own. We, we did not want our guys to make them robotic and uh, to, to tell them every single time what they, what they do. So even when we, we would call a play and we would call certain option out of that offense, we wanted our guys to use their own head their own instincts, and we trusted our guys, they're gonna make uh, right decisions. All of those decisions are based on a uh, uh, certain set of rules, which always go back to identity. Are, are you playing inside 0.5? Are you playing pain to grade? Are you executing right spacing on the floor? Are, if they're denying you, are you going for the back door? In pick and roll, if they go under the screen, we want to, to rescreen and play out of that. So if you put it that way, offense would become like so much complex and so many options out of it. And if you would try to teach all of those options, you would lose so much time and players would become so hard. It would be so hard to teach those guys. But once you give them freedoms and basic set of rules and they need to use their own judgment on the floor, that creates a great buy-in. Players feel they're a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And they take a lot of pride of uh, recognizing situations on the floor, making right decisions, and knowing that that way they're helping their team. That's, that, that, that's not going to necessarily put them in a position for them to score, for them to uh, drive the ball, but it's going to allow whole offense to breathe and everybody would have equal opportunities. At the end of the day, the best players will have the, uh, the most shots in the game, you know, and uh, ball finds always great players. So, uh, and that was the case for us. Uh, Devin Booker, his, uh, his efficiency went through roof this year playing inside this system. And uh, we did not force feed that ball goes to him. Ball just found him. His teammates, they, they, they trust him. And they, they would throw the ball to him in situations uh, uh, where uh, they needed to do, but also to, to allow him to go.
go to work and to be effective and to be aggressive. Well, well, and that's a great point. Uh, I want to come back to a few things mentioned, but first one is players know who the best player is, right? Like you don't have to define that at that level. They know the best player and they know that the best player has a huge impact on their success too. So their goal is to put the best player in a better situation. That, that's a, that, that is correct. And uh, players know that they want the ball to be in the hands of best players, but also best player has a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. And uh, that's why those, those identity rules that we installed, they gave us a platform to keep best players accountable to a certain style of play. And if Devin Booker would try to do too much, if you remind him, hey, that player was open. You have two on the ball. You've got to make a quick decision. You've got to find him. And when we would watch film next day, uh, when we would prepare for the next game, he would always acknowledge that. He's a very coachable player. Uh, he wants the best for the team, and he wants to win, and he wants to do the right things. So he, we had complete buy-in by Devin and whole team, and actually – his leadership and playing the right way allowed other guys to to be less selfish and also more uh, more uh, oriented by uh, playing this certain style of play that will that would allow everybody equal opportunities. The thing I want to piggyback on that you talked about is this template of structure, and what is often misunderstood when I talk about freedom and develop, developing players to play free is that freedom and creativity starts with structure. It moves from structured to unstructured. It doesn't start with unstructured. And that's exactly what you described as you're talking about this, is that your players get more freedom once they understand structure. Yes, uh, that structure uh, and basic rules and basic principles, they allow players to, uh, to know what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to play, where they need to be on the floor to, to allow other players. And again, like when we talk about uh, Phoenix Suns, when we talk about NBA t players, we're talking about best of the best. We're talking about best players in, in the world. And the uh, amazing thing about those guys is their ability to learn really quickly, to adapt, and, uh, and to grow. And uh, when that happens inside the team and you have that structure and uh, inside that structure, when you give them opportunities to make their own decisions, it is amazing how much opportunities and how many more options they bring to the table. Some things that you never thought about, they, 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 they're going to bring it on the table. And uh, they will not get paralyzed with overthinking but they were going to play with instincts and much faster. When you play your instincts, when you're playing free basketball, your decisions are quick, you're sharp, you're, uh, your, your decisions are, I would say, much more accurate than when you got to overthink everything and, and think about every little aspect of offense. And uh, that's why putting that structure early and understanding how you want to play inside the offense and what are the basic rules. Players, they, they uh, pick up those things very quickly. And later on, they are able to, to add their own uh, flavor to the offense, their own um, strength to the offense. And that allows you really to grow as a team. Super insights already. And we're going to dig a little deeper here too with how you teach. Can you talk a little bit about how you teach using the three layers uh, that you talk about? So um, when we put our offense uh, in place and we put uh, five on all those guys in the right spots and we allow them to play, we really encourage them to, to play inside those, those rules. For example, every time a player would drive the ball, we would ask him for that to use the dribble to be aggressive to be uh, for, for forceful and to be to touch the paint. And once we are touching the paint, a lot of times we would stop at that point and we're just like, are we in the right spots? Are you allowing that drive to develop? Are you in the right spot if defense commits to, to get an open shot? And uh, from that, that stage, like when we go into playing five on five, 
like we want, we, we will stop our offense. We will stop it and we will have understanding with players that we need to address things so we can get better. And we would not just uh, go every single time through the play, allow everything to, to finish and then address things. Like we have agreement with players at the start of the year that we're going to stop and we're going to coach and we're going to ask their, for their input. I think that's very, very important part of teaching process is asking questions, stopping a practice. What do we have over here? What happened? What do you see? And players, a lot of times, like if they saw or they just did one thing, when you ask them those questions, when you guide them, they're going to give you an answers and they will understand what they need to do. And they will understand how much they depend on each other. Player that needs to relocate to the, to the extreme corner is so crucial to put the defense lower so that can allow the drive to happen. If, if the defense stays too high, now it's on that player that's, uh, that's uh, driving the ball to recognize that he has two on the ball, that there is no room to finish at the rim, that he needs to make extra pass. But that player, he needs to be in the right spot. A lot of times, like when you stop the practice, when you ask those questions, it is amazing how many times player actually will give you correct answer. And uh, not just that, that we want them to give us correct answer, we want to learn from them. Like what, what are more options that you see? What else can we do over here? If defense is, is doing this, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example that later on in a training camp, we were running a, a horns type of action that would put uh, 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 Ricky Ruby at point guard, but it, uh, instead of having four men to set a screen, we had Devin Booker to set a screen. So first pick and roll was Ricky Ruby or Devin Booker, and we had a five-man high. So uh, horns with a small in it. Um, so, uh, it's amazing when we asked Ricky, when we asked book, what are other options that you have over here? And they showed us like several options, like spacing wise, what they like to do, what are their own preferences, uh, how they can play off of each other. And both of those guys, they complemented each other and allow an other player to play and to be aggressive but also created some more uh, options for us offensively that we did not have in our playbook, that, it, that, it, that we did not have uh, planned. And once you hear your players, once you get their input, the, the learning process is much more faster. Like uh, you cannot just teach and expect players, uh, and, uh, students just to listen. You gotta engage them in conversation. You gotta allow those guys to have their own input. And once you have that, you have their intention. Uh, focus span is much longer. The creativity is there, and the trust is there. And that's one thing. Trust is a huge, huge part of our offense and our relationships inside the team. That we wanted players to feel that once they come to the practice, that's a safe environment. Like we are here to get better, we are here, here, here to help each other, and we are here to show that we are vulnerable. None of us we have all the answers. None of us we have all the all, all the, the solutions. But uh, accepting that certain things we could do better, listening to each other, and being able to move from it as a, as as a whole as a team was a huge huge part of teaching process for us and allow us to, 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 to have one cohesive group this year. Really like that. I want to just ask you, because again, I think this is a mistake coaches make. If we think about it in terms of teaching the whole first, the one advantage is you don't have to waste time on unnecessary parts. That process you go through as a coaching staff after you put it in, say this one play and then you play, you can evaluate it and then decide what parts you actually need to break down or work on more. Is that happening? Yes, uh, that's the uh, that's exact uh, exactly the reason why we wanted to put a hole first and to 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 see guys play out of it, so we could recognize and learn from players and learn from from watching video and learn from talking to the guys what actually works best for our team. So later on, we could break down that into, into parts and uh, 
later on in the season, you know, when you're going through shoot arounds, when you don't have really a lot of time that you cannot play a lot of through contra contact, like we would use those parts and teach those parts and go through it as a preparation for the games, as a reminder for the guys that, uh, that they can use uh, in games. And uh, the next layer that we would add to that was understanding coverages, like what defense might be doing uh, in the game with pin downs, are they going shoot a gap or lock and chase, and what kind of counters, what kind of type of shots we can, uh, we can be looking from that. But uh, again, to go back to, 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 to the beginning, everything starts with a hole. Everything starts like putting the system in, allowing guys to play five on five, allowing them to learn, but also us to learn what is the best for the team. Then potentially taking parts of that, analyzing it, adjusting it, and moving it back to, to the hole. We wanted to spend as much as possible in hole. We, we wanted to spend as much time as possible uh, being focused on uh, whole team and playing five on five and not really spend a lot of time in, uh, in I don't know, one, two, three against zero, no defense situations. We did not want to spend a lot of time on that. We believe that learning process for, for, for players is, is much faster and much better and has better quality and of, tra of transfer when you, uh, when you address it this way and when you teach it in the whole. Well, we know that basketball transfers to basketball. So transfer absolutely happens when you play basketball. And the other part here is that a lot of coaches listening might think, okay, this is great at the NBA level, but I want to, I share this at all levels. Sometimes there's a misconception. I'm anti drills. I'm not anti anything, to be honest. I'm just anti wasting time and doing fluff that doesn't help your players improve or your team win. And that's what a lot of those predetermined progressions are, predetermined breakdowns are. Play the game and then figure out what you need to work on. That's the process. And I'm so glad that, that you helped shape this conversation with so many of these insights. Well, Chris, um, to be honest with you, uh, I was not always doing it this way. I'm, uh, I started, Nor was I. <laughs> Nor was I, Coach. Yeah, I, was, I started coaching when I was 16 years old, and I'm 40 years old now, so 24 years old of coaching experience. And I, uh, I did it like old school, what other coaches did and what I learned, and I tried to replicate that. And um, I always felt the same way. Always felt that how can I become more efficient? How I can use the time better? How, how I can improve the learning process? And the other thing that, that's very important to understand is we're not dealing with same type of players that were like 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago. We got to go with the generation. And this generation today is very visual generation. And uh, their learning uh, patterns are different than it was when I was going in a high school. And uh, uh, last several years, uh, it, it really caught my attention and uh, of different way of approaching things and uh, uh, doing it as much as possible as a whole and uh, doing it as much as possible in a team environment concept and not wasting time on drills that are not necessarily, that, that, that's not gonna move the needle. And uh, if I could go back and big part of my career was working with uh, youth programs and youth teams, I would have a different approach and I would, I would spend much more time playing it five on five and teaching the game that way and uh, less drilling. Drill, drills a lot of times, they are um, very satisfactory for, for coaches and it's much easier to achieve some kind of perfection in, in a drill but how much of that you're gonna have as a transfer into game? How much of that information players are actually gonna uh, uh, receive and, and implement in the game? That's other question. So uh, if I could go back and I would work with young guys, and I think this is actually the message for uh, those uh, high school coaches and, uh, and uh, coaches working with uh, younger players, don't be afraid to try it. And uh, you will be, 
you will be surprised with the reaction of the team. You will supr be surprised of the uh, retaining information. And also you will be surprised how much you as a coach are going to enjoy that approach of uh, coaching the game. That's great. And I'm glad you touched on it, that players enjoy it. They love to play basketball and I've asked coaches at clinics and I've asked people before, but it's like, you know, Darko, you know, when you go play pickup, are you starting with three man weave? Are you doing shell drill? No, you're playing basketball. And that's the fun of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's play more basketball. Uh, let's move on to video and using video to teach because this is kind of the third layer of this is how do you use video? to support your install and refinement of your offense? So um, we use video uh, in, in different ways. And uh, first, of, first is uh, showing video to, to the whole team. And uh, what we try to do is teach, show options, make corrections, and we want to involve players as much as possible to, to be part of that and to share. What we found out is in that setup where, you know, you have whole team there and like whole coaching staff, players are not uh, inclined really to open up easily and to talk. You know, some guys will do, but they don't really feel comfortable in those setups. So what we did a lot this year is we uh, showed film in uh, individual setup, but also in a group setup, you know, um, uh, Devin, uh, Devin Booker would play together with uh, um, DeAndre Ayton and they're playing round post up. Get those two guys, show them like what they're going through, ask them questions. And it is amazing how those guys, they start actually talking to each other. And uh, communication is a, such a huge part of teaching. Communication is such a huge part of uh, of improving your team and uh i see with players nowadays they don't they're not really comfortable to talk to each other but once you put them in that setup that they have video that they need to analyze it they need to talk to each other that you ask questions it is amazing how much those guys open up and share good ideas and help that uh, and help their improvement a lot of times, like when we show video in that individual or group or team setup, we're going to ask guys, like, what do you see over here? Like, wh why did we make mistake over here? And they will tell us the problem was pacing. I hold the ball too much. Uh, I didn't pass the ball to open, open man, whatever it might be. But also we're going to ask them, like, what are other options that you had over here? And players would, would really recognize those situations. I could go all the way to the rim. Uh, I see it right now. And if you rewind it back and uh, one dribble back, it's a completely different picture. And they can, when they can see those images and those images visually stick with those guys, they will have opportunity to, to transfer that in a, in a game setup much faster. So uh, to answer your question, watching video and giving a video feedback to players and also engaging guys in that, that process uh, is something that really helps players to, to improve and it's going to really help your, your offense to, to, to get better. Coach, what are maybe some things that coaches haven't thought about when it comes to video, uh, this traditional model of everyone in a team room? for a long video session, you know, that by and large is gone. So give us an idea of some of the effective practical strategies for using video. So um, um, we never stayed longer watching film, any kind of film. Uh, we never stayed longer than 10 to 12 minutes. You know, a lot of times that's a quick five minute film. Like, you know, we always try to keep it like after games to show five offensive, five defensive clips to focus really on the most important things. And uh, you cannot coach uh, every single aspect of the game, every single mistake that happened in the game. You gotta have approach that's gonna, that's gonna open up solutions for the players and not to criticize players and to take their confidence and like, 
you know, a lot of times it's easy to watch that film and to be emotional about it. In a sense, like, oh, we just lost last night again and everything is bad. And, you know, and then you show much more film that, than you would show when you, when you win. So uh, for us, it was always trying to stay consistent with the message, trying to, st to st not to be emotional about it and try to focus on the most important things. Like we would never like, if we would see patterns that are repeating and that we needed to address, we would address those things. If Ricky Rubio commits five turnovers in one game, we would not show video of that next morning and we would not kill Ricky Rubio because of five turnovers for, for, for multiple reasons. First of all, he knows, he's aware of that. Second of all, he did not have one turnover in previous five games. So it's not something that's pattern that's repeating. So it just happened one night. Like you cannot be emotional about it. And uh, having that uh, big picture mentality, uh, understanding where you need to lead your team, in what direction to lead your team, that's how you use your video. It's not uh, just to prove your point. It's to allow your team to grow. It's to allow your team to get better. That's such an important thing. It's, it's not just to prove your point, it's to help your players improve. And you know, all the best coaches are doing that in that way and talking about that. So that's a really cool connection there. So going back a little bit, let's talk about different coverages. If we're to look at one segment of auto after you've installed it, they played with it, and then you've decided that you need to uh, work on a specific part of it, let's say against switching, what is that process? Can you talk, talk us through that process, a little bit of how you actually do it? Uh, thank you for asking that question. It's, uh, it is very important to, to, to do that. So, uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So we, we run that offense uh, and we put it in and the offense is functioning, but other teams are scouting. They have tendencies of the players. They know tendencies of the offense. They will throw different things at you. And uh, what we did a lot is uh, when we were pr preparing for certain teams and we know, for example, we played Houston Rockets and Houston Rockets is switching one through five. So we knew that going into that game, we needed to slip in pick and rolls. We, need, we knew that we needed to create confusion for them. We, we knew that we needed to, uh, to throw the ball in the post up uh, to DeAndre Ayton against uh, uh, smaller guards guarding him. And what we did in the practice is we had coaches. We put five coaches, video guys on the floor, and uh, they would play defense that way and we could execute it. But also we played five of five in the practice with those same, same uh, defensive rules but making adjustments in our offense that we need to slip much more in pick and rolls, that we need to roll to the rim. That's the way that we, that we need to attack the paint and that we got to dominate the glass. And uh, so we did not go away from our offense. We did not go away from our structure. We just pointed out one detail and uh, adjustment in, in uh, offense in slipping pick and rolls and rolling more to the rim instead of uh, sometimes popping. And uh, it, it, it really functioned great in the game against Houston and we beat Houston in, uh, in Phoenix when we played against those guys. Uh, again, we will play against team that we know that uh, Denver Nuggets, uh, they're gonna blitz trap every pick and roll of Devin Booker. We would do the same thing. We would have coaches just to 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 play defense and uh, five on five, and would just tell them, "Okay, we got to blitz every time." Now, with that being said, we did not want guys to understand that as a drill and to, to turn off. Okay, they're gonna blitz me every single time. This is what we gotta do. So we would tell coaches or we would tell defensive team to mix in defensive coverages and to do different things. So guys always have to sh stay sharp. They always got to understand what's going on. And those are the moments that we would really stop the practice and teach it. Like if defense would blitz and we want our big men to go in a short throw, getting out quickly to be available to catch the ball, we wanted to bring corner guys up high so they can receive the ball. All of those things would come out 
out of our outer offense in the moment that pick and roll would happen. And now the guys, they needed to adjust. They could not just go and play whatever they want. They needed to adjust to the new situation, solving a problem, and getting into the right spots. And from there, just playing again, playing 0.5, our identity, identity, and playing to the strengths of the team. And uh, this way of adapting your offense and preparing your offense for, for the next opponent, for the next game, is something that, that uh, guys really enjoyed. They, we never went away from our style of play. We never went away from our offense. We did not go to running some other sets. We just uh, ready. We were just ready for the counters. And guys really enjoyed of uh, enjoyed this way of of teaching them. So instead of just going five on all and say this is gonna they, what they're gonna do, we're gonna be in those positions. We would put defense right away. And we would make guys make mistakes, and then we would correct them. And again, uh, we would go back to play final five, and allow them to execute it again. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, players uh, they pick up on those things really quickly, and uh, allowed us to have really quick transfer into into the games that we were facing certain type of uh, coverages and defenses. Well, I can imagine, and that got back to transfer and the, the importance of transferring stuff from practice to the game. And uh, you know, the other thing is, this is that was an outstanding example of a constraint-led approach when you create a condition to shape your players' learning. In that example, working versus a certain coverage, and that's that's everything. That's how you create drills to be able to help your players improve and to help their help your team win. And then, as they get more comfortable, you can mix in multiple possibilities so they have to learn to identify ultimately what what happened and what can happen that's right that's right and uh one thing i would say with that is uh players are really competitive and uh they want to win and they want to do well and they want to make shots you know so once you really um honor that and uh, and give them freedom and uh, give them uh, and create a buy-in the learning process is so much faster and guys do a great job. Coach, we've done all this and now what's the process of feedback? What's the feedback loop within your organization? Uh, the, the, the way to get a feedback for, from players is, uh, first of all, they have to have a trust in a coaching staff and a team so they can be honest. Like you want guys to be honest. And uh, once you implement your system once you're playing games you gotta ask players how do you feel about this is this comfortable for you uh to show them film like sometimes there are areas that you want to address and get better at it sometimes you need to go away from certain options on your offense sometimes you gotta change it like sometimes you just see that that it's not working but engaging players, getting a feedback from them, talking to those guys is so important. And I think on NBA level, um, the huge part is played by assistant coaches and their relationships with players because assistant coaches are the ones who are dealing with players daily in our workouts and watching individual video and group video and all of that. So getting a good feel for what they think, how they feel inside the offense, what are the areas that we, we could do better and improve is the way to go about it. And uh, inside of that, there, there has to be a really good connection between uh, head coach and assistant coaches and the trust there. So uh, you can be free to share those thoughts with your head coach and uh, for him to understand in what way he needs to move the team, in what direction he needs to move the team. And that's one thing that our team did exceptionally good job with Coach uh, Monty is that we had really open uh, relationships and uh, players trusted him, coaches trusted him, and there was always open communication. His doors are always open and he always wants to, to talk game and to, to get a feedback and to learn from uh, both players and coaches. Wow. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your openness and sharing this valuable information and obviously to both Monty Williams and the Phoenix Suns organization as well for supporting you doing this. I don't think there could be anything better than you sharing the process. And thank you so much for spending time with us.
Thank you, Chris. And um, um, it was a pleasure to be part of your podcast and uh, keep up with good work. Thanks, bud.